Hi, this is Will Stewart from OnlineChessLessons.net, and I'll be continuing my coverage of the 2011 U.S. Championship with a round four victory by Alexander Shabalov with the black pieces over current tournament leader Sam Shankland. And uh, let's go ahead and get on with it. So the game was pretty exciting. Shankland was leading the tournament um, at, at least with the Group B section, and Shabalov was at the bottom. I believe he had one draw and two losses, so kind of uh, opposite opposite uh, tournaments going for him here, but it didn't matter in this game. So Shanklin opens up with a uh, with d4, and, and Shabalov indicates he's ready to take things into a Nimzo Indian. So Shanklin plays uh, knight f3 is kind of an anti-Nimzo line. Um, now, if if bishop b4 by black, um, it goes into a different different styles. So here, d5 by Shabalov is, seems to be the most principled try. A after knight f3, you know, knight f3 is not, uh, I don't know, trying to avoid the Nimzo. So d5, go ahead. So now here is kind of offering to take things into a Slav or, or semi-Slav um, style for black. And so with g3 as white, um, you know, this is pretty standard stuff, both sides, just developing and trying to fight for the center, you know, develop your pieces as fast as possible. And so now castles and castles and D takes C4. So maybe this is, uh, I, I, I don't know exactly what this line is called. It gets very complicated. And uh, after queen C2, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, there's a couple different ideas here. Maybe you can play a6, I believe. is This This is uh, a6, queen takes c4, and b5. And after bishop b7, bishop, D, bishop f4 was a move. And I believe I've seen quite a few games where white uh, snatches this pawn, but it's kind of draw-ish. Because, uh, I, I don't know, I mean, black gets to complete his develop very fast. And he also gets to occupy the C-file first. So, anyways, um, after after D takes C4, Queen C2. And now Shabalov, who is definitely no slouch and a very, uh, very aggressive player, he plays B5. And now this is an invitation to get a little crazy. Because um, in, in one line, you know, you can see knight e5. And it, it looks like, okay, white is just going to chop that rook on a8. The game's over. But knight d5 to block. And uh, it, it's going to get very complicated here. Possibly knight c3. And maybe you could say c6 is a possibility. And, and I mean, this is just, uh, this, this is way too complicated. I, I don't want to spend the whole video analyzing a sideline. So back to what happened in the game. So B5 and A4 here. So white is, uh, I mean, these pawns are very weak. And this, this diagonal, the H1 to 8 diagonal is extremely weak. So A4 makes sense. A little bit of, uh, a little bit of patience, I guess you could say. And just, just undermine those weak pawns a little bit more. And B4 by Shabalov. So he is... No, definitely not scared to complicate things and after knight e5 it seems like maybe knights maybe c6 if you want to sign another pawn or, or knight you know let's say knight d7 knight knight d5 here and um you know at least white's going to get his pawn back and, and probably have a pretty comfortable center so instead shablov says hey i mean it's just material right it's just just a rook so bishop takes a8 and queen takes e5. And so now the position is very complicated. And, uh, you know, okay, so black is down in exchange. But for the moment, he has two pawns for the exchange. And so maybe, um, you know, queen takes c4. Maybe he didn't want to play that in light of bishop a6. Possibly the idea of c6 or, or some way to trap that bishop and, and trade that. It's a very good piece for white. Um, but bishop a6 would just seem to be a simple a simple kind of refutation of the immediate queen takes c4. And, and now um, this is not looking so fun all of a sudden for, for white. So let's go back. Bishop f3, so maybe preparing queen takes c4. And after bishop a6, the e2 pawn would be guarded. And so bishop a6 right away. And this game, kind of how Shabalov played it, reminds me something of a, how the king's gambit is played for white as he holds on to these two pawns 
and makes White really try to earn it if he wants to to win it. If he wants to win one of those pawns, even though they're they're weak and extended as they are, it, he really makes them earn it. So, you know, taking stock, Black is down in exchange, but he's got two pawns for it. If he can hold it on those pawns, he's going to have ample compensation, especially with his active pieces in the center. So bishop f4 makes sense. Kick that queen. And now um, queen a5. Possible argument for for queen c5 could be made, but maybe not in light of bishop e3 picking off that a7 pawn. So I think that's why, you know, at first queen a5 seems kind of weird, but, you know, a bishop's, bishop e3 picking off the a7 pawn, not so good for black. So queen a5 holding the position together. And so now knight to d2 and it looks like okay maybe maybe white is going to be able to you know pick up that c4 pawn if he does there's a very good chance he's going to win because then he'll have an exchange for a pawn and he'll also be able to generate some pressure along the c file so instead b3 and so you know not so easy easier said than done taking that c4 pawn and so pretty much what's going on is black is is using these pawns dynamically and he's really fighting to to maintain the initiative and white is uh you know it, this is a difficult position to play all of a sudden i mean maybe shabalov it, it seems like he had prepared this because he'd used about five maybe ten minutes of his clock now and shanklin had used about a half hour so i think this was a you know i think sam shanklin walked into some some theoretical preparation and shabalov's definitely an experienced gm so i i wouldn't put it past him to to have this one up his sleeve so now queen c1 and this is something to be said here briefly. If knight takes c4, looks like maybe tactically he gets out of it. But after queen b4, just going to be dropping that knight. So you don't want to play queen c3 um, for multiple reasons. I mean, let's just start with bishop b4. Well, I could even take it. Now all of a sudden protected pass pawn. So queen c3 is not going to cut it. So queen c1 and now queen b4. So just he's holding on to that pawn. And knight b1. So not a good sign for Shanklin that he's got to uh, retreat retreat that knight. This pawn on a4 is now very weak, and it's becoming increasingly difficult for him to attack that, that pawn on c4. And so knight d5, so that's a, definitely a strong move. You know, he could have, um, black could settle here, and he could play a natural developing move, rook d8, or possibly knight bd7, but... You know why these why these top players are so good is because they make the very most of it. Even coming out of the opening or in the early middle game is this. You know you want to make the most pressing moves, the most aggressive, the most accurate moves to really put the pressure on your opponent. And so Shabalov does that here with knight d5, and possibly his idea, um, as far as you know, it's it's definitely putting a little pressure on that bishop on f4, and maybe his idea was simply to play I don't know c3. Maybe his idea was c3 here. And, um, you know, just getting rid of the double pawns. Just a possibility. Idle speculation. Knight d5. Or maybe he wants to play knight c6. And so he wants to block this, this bishop's diagonal. So he can play knight c6. Threaten knight d4. That's going to spell trouble for white, no matter how you look at it. And so bishop d2. Pushing the black queen back. Okay, so now the queen can, can also go to c5. An advantage of having played knight d5 because now white can't really play bishop e3 i mean that's that's just not going to work so after knight c3 so white did reroute the knight successfully from d2 to c3 and shablov still is only used i think about 15 minutes here and shanklin is about uh, he's used about 30 or 40 minutes so now knight c6 so that does seem to be one of the points of playing the, the knight to d5 earlier as the knight comes to c6 no problem threatens to come into d4 threatens to come into e5 and also to b4 and so rook d1 now and, um, you know, white is, let's look at all these pieces on the back rank. So he's up in exchange, but black has two pawns for it. And he's very active play in the center. So I'd say black has definitely got a, a plus here, definite plus. And it's very tough for white to develop his pieces without incurring more weaknesses. Like, it, you know, if he tries to kick this very strong centralized knight out of d5 with e4, that's going to open up a huge hole on d3. So that that's just not going to work. So... 
it's it's very difficult to play white in this type of position with when black has everything active and it's just you know going easily so knight e4 queen b6 seems to be forced here and after a5 now queen back to b8 so the queen retreats he doesn't want to give white any more tempo attacking the queen and after bishop e3 bishop b5 and now bishop c5 so this is uh you know White is trying to gain some space by trading some pieces off the board, get a little breathing room. And so after knight takes, and white maybe has made a little bit of progress by trading those those dark squared bishops. And so queen a7, a uh, good move. This, this diagonal is definitely a good place for the queen to be. And white is... Uh, so Black has solidified his, his pieces. You know, this bishop on b5 doesn't look so great, but it's it's holding it together for sure. And so now knight d4. So definitely a good point of having that queen aiming towards the center. Knight d4 is a monster knight. Um, just just a plenty of threats here. So bishop g2. He doesn't want to get the pawns doubled and, and give up that d3 square. And now knight c2. So maybe, I, I think, Shanklin's best chance was to sack the exchange back here and in this position he's down a pawn but are these doubled pawns really that great for black I I think I believe this was his best chance I mean possibly I I don't know I mean I, I just think that was the only maybe one of the only real chances he had but he didn't want to do it and so he played rook rook b1 and um now queen d1 and this this knight i mean it's got to be worth an exchange on that c2 square you know and if you sack it i mean the, this the c pawns doubled you know i mean you could even sack it now after c6 i mean so queen c7 good move bring the queen back towards the center and also threaten that pawn on a5 if you want and rook f8 so he was um knight e4 was kind of a sneaky move because he he was lining up e4 to win a piece with that uh that battery along the d-file so rook f8 bishop e4 knight b4 so he doesn't obviously he doesn't want to allow the bishop to take it and bishop takes and now undoubled pawns and black is still got the he's down in exchange but he still got the two pawns and so that was why uh you know e4 to undermine and now knight d3 fantastic square for the knight again queen h5 kind of a superficially active move and now black snatches that pawn and now after knight c3, bishop c6, an incredible diagonal for the black pieces. And bishop b7, so very simply just bring the bishop, bishop, and queen to c6, and play for mate. And very difficult to stop for white. Now queen c6, and f3. And after g6, I believe Sam Shanklin just resigned because he's facing a horrible endgame to play here. And, uh, you know, I don't see a forced win immediately for white, but he's going to have three pawns for an exchange plus a monster knight on d3 who's going to be continuing pressuring that b2 pawn. I, I think Shabalov's going to win this all day, not to mention Shanklin's downtime. So a great game played by Shabalov. Looks like Sa Sam Shanklin fell into some home preparation. And uh, this is Will Stewart from OnlineChessLessons.net, and thanks for tuning in.